Greetings. We're having an another episode of the Genesis of U32, the D Union High School District number 32, which serves 7th through 12th graders and opened in the fall of 1971. And I'm Betty Keller. I entered as an 8th grader when the school opened, and I have with me here as a guest Alice Blatchley. She is the parent of one of my um, friends at school and is, is you know, of course, a taxpayer and citizen as well as um, a voter and a mother, and she also served on the school board. She was not on the school board when it first opened, and I do want to pay tribute to the people who were on the board when it first opened. And um, the board of directors initially was Paul Andrews, Robert Wells, Claude Magnant, Rosendo Cueto, who went by Rosie, Houghton Kate, George Pittman, and O. Richard Clark. And I think he went by Dick? What's that? O. Richard Clark, I think he went by Dick. What did he? We well, went by Dick, yeah. 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 And um, so we should stick a picture up this that you can all see more easily. But as my husband would say, looking at this picture, how did this group of middle-aged men in the middle of Vermont come up with this idea, this middle of rural Vermont, come up with this idea of starting such a progressive school. Where did that come from? So I'm very glad to have Alice Blatchley with me here today talking about um, the beginning of the school. We had a previous episode talking about um, the very beginning of the school board going out and visiting other schools and had just gotten to where we were talking about Alice's actual time on the board and why she started serving. So Alice, thank you for being here today. And um, if we could just kind of pick up a little bit, so the, those were the original members of the board, and of course the school board members, you know, they have one and two year terms and they get voted in, in and yeah. more people replace mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And so um, at the time that you um, were asked by community members to join the board, to run for board, I should say, um, at that time, two women from Berlin had replaced a couple of the men on the board. Mm -hmm. um, and that was Mary Anderson and Ruth Town. Mm -hmm. So if you could pick up the story from there a little bit, that would be great. Yeah. Well, uh, Ruth, um, I was kind of warned. You know, you're going to find uh, Ruth Town difficult to work with, probably. Um, she's very, very uh, determined uh, and, and, and very concerned about uh, they really don't, she and, and, and Mary Anderson don't like the school as they want it changed. They really actually want the expensive, uh, well, Bill, Bill Grady actually had already resigned. So when I got on, uh, Jim Dawson was, he had been the uh, assistant principal, so he took over. So it really became a, a real fight. It, it was a, an embattled school, you might say. I mean, we there were f factions. There were two. There was the sort of liberal faction, and the and it became more so until it got better. <laughs> so uh, simply you, by what? I'm sorry. Could you actually? I, we skipped over that little bit of when Bill left. Yeah. Um, so on our previous episode, yeah. um, Bill Grady was the first principal. Jim Dawson yeah. was the vice principal at the time. Bill had been involved in the actual design of the school. We had a school architect, you know, the, had laid out the plan and he had taken them off and visited some schools without walls and wanted to do some of the same. So tell me about um, Bill Grady's tenure there and why he chose to leave. Well, he, he chose to leave because he felt that the only way to save the school was for him to leave because he had become such a bone of contention, that's too, that's too mild a term. I mean, all of the anger and stuff just, <laughs> he was at the cross currents of it and he uh, just felt that as long as he was there, it was always going to center on his, uh, uh, the school wouldn't, couldn't really function properly because so much attention was, uh, uh, was gonna have to be on just trying to defend himself in this school. Uh, and, um, so can you tell us a little bit about James Dawson now? So then he, he did leave, and some people very much regret that, that just didn't think maybe he wished that he had, hadn't because I think, I think he would, the school would have survived very well if he'd stayed. But in any case, he was such a strong personality, was such and so articulate that he had certainly made an impression on Jim Dawson who came on as assistant principal 
uh, but um, and endorse Bill's ideas and learn a great deal. So Jim did his best to carry this on, it, but he, but it, unfortunately, the you know the all the anger that had been centered on Bill now centered on Jim Dawson, and there were people who wanted him to resign, as if somehow or other that would resolve all these issues and make everything all right. Uh, he did a, a really great job of. Uh, of, defend, of holding on to his ideas and yet being very, um, you know, listening to everybody, caring about the kids. I mean, this was a huge job. I, I don't know how anybody does it, and he did it very well, I thought. Uh, and he became a very good friend. I mean, I really, mm, I had great respect for him. Well, um, so, but the others on the board, uh, I was really, uh, I mean, I, mean I, I think just the, I think ultimately what happened was that the people who liked the school, who loved it, who, who thought it was doing wonderful things with their kids, uh, outnumbered actually in the towns, the, the ones who were. Um, right, so, so mm -hmm. just for history in case somebody isn't familiar with how we, you know, how we do our public schools in Vermont. The school board is voted, each town gets to vote in one, two, or three people depend, depend, depending on their population. Mm -hmm. So the towns vote them in. Yeah. The school board makes a decision about who to hire for the yes. principal and the vice principal. Yes. Oh, yeah. So the fact that they chose, that the school board, selected by the citizens, chose to keep Jim Dawson, knowing that he shared Bill Grady's philosophy and make him be the principal, means that that was, that was what the towns overall wanted, but there were some people who were concerned that this style of school was not serving all of the children, and those children who could benefit from more structure, who had different learning styles, and needed, uh, needed some of the kind of traditional supports that, that the parents were used to, at least that's what the parents' perception was, they were voting people on the board too. So you had to negotiate. That's so can you right. talk a little we bit about that, please? We had to negotiate. We had to work this out. And uh, I'm not sure that the, um, actually, I, once, once I was off the board and I didn't have children in the school, I kind of lost touch with whether, how they tried to resolve this issue of these children who uh, were used to a lot more structure and um, were having trouble getting a hold of this, of the, program and doing something with it, you know, being able to function. And I don't know whether there's still a problem there or whether they through, I, I know they worked very hard at it, so I believe they found a way for, to meet both needs, you, they should be able to do it through, um, or maybe just time and the fact that the school, one thing that helped a lot was that the school started having very successful sports teams <laughs> and that you know that's important that you know the youth are you start winning games and <laughs> that was very very good so the first year was pretty interesting on that yeah. score you took these kids some of them had gone to montpelier some had mm -hmm. gone to spalding hardwick plainfield and then you put them in this school together mm -hmm. essentially n none of your kids had really played they may have played little league for baseball for instance but they weren't mm -hmm. typically actually playing for those high schools because they couldn't stay after school because they didn't have a ride home. Good point. Good and so point, yeah. all these kids come together and they might have some raw talent, but they had very little skill, <laughs> a lot mm -hmm. of them, and no training for like, what is teamwork? So the first year or two were pretty fun and funny. <laughs> 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 we didn't have a lot of wins, except actually gymnastics did very well, be, not the first year, but the second year and, and they're on because it was new all around the state. So all yeah. the teams were in that struggling area. Mm -hmm. And the girls teams might have tended to do a little bit better too because I think it was pretty new for Title IX. So the idea that um, you know, if you had a field hockey team, there might not be that many field hockey teams with a ton of experience either. So I can't remember exactly which teams did better, but the boys' basketball the <laughs> and the boys' baseball teams took a little time. Uh, and we had no football because it cost too much. And those oh, parents yeah. who wanted their sons to be football players, some of them was, were pretty angry. <laughs> okay. Now, see, I didn't even know about that. That's very... Good, yeah. Yeah, and so they do important. have a football team now. I'm not sure how long it took, but they put their money into soccer, which is so much cheaper, so they had more money for the academics. But, um, but right. that was... Okay. Yeah. 
so you know and mm, that's that's really interesting uh, but after a few there. years you know by the time you get into yeah. your fourth year you're on the same boat as everybody else and that you all got in there at freshman year so by the time for instance tommy was graduating then you could have more likely to have winning teams yeah um so i remember that you know i i had to change my mind a bit too because I felt that uh, it was disproportionate to be putting so much of the school's budget, you know, into sports, which could only benefit a rather small number of them, because not everybody was suitable for, certainly for the, you know, the competing mm -hmm. teams. Uh, but the uh, the argument had been, uh, this is traditional, really, in American high schools for years. Well, but if you don't have these sports teams, there are kids. Who wouldn't even you would they drop out of school if it weren't for sports? That's the thing that keeps them. So all and, right, and you that's have to actually deal with that. yeah, that can be a motivator for a kid. I mean, the, to yeah. keep them. So at first I said, yeah, but you need dramatics, and uh, but I focused on dramatics because I thought that can be er, there's something for everybody in drama, and everybody can be in a play or do tech or something. Yeah, the stage crew. And, yeah, and I mean the question is how educational is it? We actually discussed education on the school board, which was great. <laughs> you know, we really, it, it wasn't just budget and mm -hmm. administrative uh, mm -hmm. details. It was, um, but there's well, so many skill, what life is skills. the educational value of this particular activity? Right. And um, that, was, that was very good. I mean, um, we, we had to keep asking that because the tendency for school boards is to get bogged down in administrative stuff. Right. So. But in any case, I think I did come to see that, yes, sports is good. You know, as I say, you learn sportsmanship. You, le you learned... Um, Setting you know, goals, working toward them, sticking with that, them. That was good. Mm -hmm. But it shouldn't be exclusive. I mean, the, you should give equal opportunity for, for other things. And that worked out um, because I think most... I think uh, I remember having to write a letter to the editor of the Times Argus about because the school was in danger of practically just um, putting no money at all into dramatics mm -hmm. and arts. They were going to cut way down on that. And that would really surprise our and listeners. I remember arguing something about how you don't lop off. So I used a metaphor about tr trees. You don't, um, you, you don't attack a, a, a tree. If you want to prune a tree, you, tr you prune it at the branch and not at the roots. <laughs> well, somebody wrote me a letter. She said, Alice, good for you. You are good for that. Oh, wonderful. You know, uh -huh. somebody in Cal. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. anyway, um, so, but we had to um, fight that through. But I do, I do see that. So they helped. I mean, I had to listen. It was Bill Schultz who argued about that. So and, Bill Schultz uh, was another thought, board member. No, no, but then, you know, I had to. I had to concede that, and that that was good. Mm -hmm. But as but anyway, the school started having fabulous drama anyway, so that was great. But the, the first thing they did uh, uh, a musical. It was um, funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Yes, the kids were they were really good. For mm -hmm. one thing, the school. That's another thing. Bill Grady felt very strongly about drama, uh -huh. so he had a really beautiful uh, theater there with you know all the latest and lighting and all these you know, huge stage he thought that was very important and very comfortable seating for the audience that was smart because the that sold a lot of people on the school they saw these kids were doing these drama and um and doing it well and one thing that th uh, the, the the school was very interested in having the, the parents get involved and my husband at that time uh, wanted to do uh, put on a Shakespeare play. That was the first thing um, that he, uh, when my son entered there, he suggested that. And Bill Dawson enthusiastically, that's a great idea, do it. So he did it. Do you remember what the first one was? Twelfth Night. And it was wonderful. Well, a lot of the kids that were kids that my, from the school that my son had been going to, the new school, so they had been used to drama. I remember the Witherspoons, some, the Witherspoons were twins, and they yes. were in it. <laughs> That's right, because that involved twins. Right, right. I was trying to remember which year they got there, but yes. Well, it was. So it'd be Kathy yeah. and Christy, right. Anyway, or was, oh well. Uh, uh, it, it, was, it was 
it was very exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, Jim thought it was exciting. He said, this is a very exciting play. <laughs> and uh -huh. it was. And so that helped, but that wasn't, you know, it, it, it also, it mm -hmm. had very good drama people and it, that theater um, was very good to start with and it would have happened anyway. But I think that helped mm -hmm. because the kids could see and, the, uh, hey, yeah, they could do Shakespeare. Right. And, and it's good. And I can understand it. And they didn't. And it's not hard at all. And, and they didn't use abridged versions. They used the real thing. Oh, no. Right. So I was actually pretty active in theater. I mean, I did the sports, too. Uh -huh. But remember, my sister was in, was there a darkness at noon or something? There was some really <laughs> a, a dark classical kind of a thing that she was in. And then um, I was in Midsummer Night's Dream with Tommy. Oh, you were? I was Titania. He was Bottom. <laughs> oh, for goodness <laughs> sakes. I and um, oh. and then um, Thurber oh Carnival, Thur no. Thurber Carnival. Oh, and the thing about that. drama at U32 is that it drew people. It included the jocks and it included, it included yes, everybody. That's the thing. They worked that's out the I schedules like. so that you yeah. could do both. Yeah. And they would do it between sports and stuff. Um, and I mean, I remember Doug Singleton had one of the big parts in Thurber, Thurber Carnival. And Doug Singleton is like this big, lovable cuddly bear of a guy, huge guy, you'd think would be playing football and he's like doing <laughs> theater, you know? <laughs> it was yeah. so cute. Yes. I guess that's what you do when there's no football team. But <laughs> See, then the arts, so remember, um, was it Phil Stimmel was the first musical director there. Oh yes, there. Phil Stimmel, yeah. And then they recruited Carlton Doctor and he taught modern dance, which are, was our first dance class at so school. So who was that again? Carlton Doctor. Okay. He recruited the chorus and the camaraderie. He, he went to the hockey team to recruit more male singers because they didn't have enough men. <laughs> so see, that's so great. That yeah. You, you, all of these things together. Right. You and so you had, to, you, yeah. had a, you had groups of friends, but they were all interconnected. Yeah. Nobody was excluded. Oh, um, good. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, I'm very glad to hear that. Yeah. I mean, you're looking at a large enough group. If somebody wanted to be um, isolated or felt too awkward of themselves to put themselves out, then they might have not felt included. But pretty much, people could find a niche somewhere, and a lot of these niches were just really interconnected. Oh, that's very good to hear. It was. It was very pretty good. exciting that way. Yeah. It was it was just something when you when you're watching you know movies about you know the Mean Girls or the the huge cliques and stuff. It's like yeah yeah we didn't have that. <laughs> Very good because that was a so, uh, concern in the beginning is we ho didn't mm -hmm. want that to happen. Right Hoped right. It would not happen. Yeah it was pretty you know, cool. I mean that that yeah. they would uh, st isolate themselves. No. Mm -hmm. Well that's good. So yeah. was yeah. there anything else you want to talk about on the arts while we're on the arts? Yeah. Um, well. The idea, Bill Grady's idea, was the art should be central mm -hmm. to um, to the school, and and even visually, you know, they had the arts were sort of uh, uh, certainly he had the um, there was a beautiful little court a courtyard in the center of the school mm -hmm. with big glass windows, and wherever you went, you could see the changing of the seasons, right. the fruit trees in bloom. So from and, an, and another that sort of thing. Another what? perspective on the courtyard is that I've seen this in other courtyards in Vermont too. <laughs> yeah. Is mm -hmm. that how many months out of the year do we have snow? Well, it's true. <laughs> and how hard <laughs> is it to get in there with a lawnmower? So both places that I'm familiar with, both yeah. U32 and the medical center at the at the um, you know UVM Medical Center, filled in their courtyards with buildings, or rooms, extending the library, whatever. But they, it's not that practical when the best part of the year in Vermont, you Very know, school's good actually shut. <laughs> I just remember on Spring Arts Weekend, but people it, were playing something, the gamelan, yeah. and then we were the backdrop was these little petals falling. Yeah, the leaves. first year or two, it was more exciting. And then as time passed, it seems like if you cut maintenance schedule, then one place it gets cut out of is mowing that place. <laughs> That's true. And you had right. to figure out about seating and, you know, it, it just it didn't work out as practically true. as one might have dreamed. Well, as you know, uh, they did have to make some modifications after a while. I was all sold on the idea and so was the board on uh, open classrooms and, uh, you know, no walls and so on. They thought mm -hmm. as kids wandered around from one classroom, to another, they might hear something that would mm -hmm. be interesting and so on. But they did find even the most progressive mm -hmm. teachers, even the ones who were sold on it, mm -hmm. ultimately... Uh, they started putting right. up walls. Right, so let's talk about the walls in just a minute, but while we're yeah. still talking about the arts, yeah. um, we've talked about drama, we've talked about theater, but I remember when you um, went in the building, it would be the area that was over the cafeteria and a little bit closer to the parking lot. That area of the school was 
um, where they had the arts. Mm -hmm. And we had pottery, we had jewelry mm -hmm. making, we had painting and drawing, we had art history. So remember yeah. that stepped room that um, it, they had expository writing yes, and they yes. would show movies in that room. That's where driver's ed was taught so you could watch the movies of people killing each other. And <laughs> um, but, um, but that's also um, where they showed the art history class because you could show the slides of the history around the, you know, the art yeah. around the world over history. Um, but it was very easy to fit in, you know, a quarter of the year, just take a little quarter of pottery. So a lot of people could just dabble Wasn't in just something, yeah. you know, if they'd never yeah. done it before, it was access. They had yes, a little dark everyone, room. Everybody, I remember once going uh, uh, on a tour of the place with some other people, Bill Grady, and he stopped and he was discussing some mats that uh, this girl was weaving uh -huh. for his family. And uh -huh. I thought, well, that's pretty good. This guy's the principal of the school, and he right. We joked about the class in basket weaving, literally. He knew every child by name. <laughs> I Grady got. Did. I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. he would be. I think he knew the name of every single student in that school. Yeah, I think that adds so, so much yeah. when so, an but it was integrated. The that idea time. that she, she's not just weaving them. She's weaving a mat for his family, mm -hmm. you know, to use. Yeah. It's all so much more integrated. Home ec to, it wasn't home ec, it was. Living arts. Living arts. Right, right. That had Jean Peterson, she was very, very fine And Claire teacher. Ladd, yep. And that's, too, you don't make these artificial distinctions. You, right. It's so all part of life that, you know, all of this. Right, so when the school, yeah. school first opened, I think that the ninth graders had something different going on, but the, but the seventh and eighth graders had what they called tech education, and you had tech one, two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember which one was exactly which, but the general idea was that tech one might be a combination of um, geometry and you know pre-algebra mm -hmm. and um, physics or something, and then tech two might be um, the living arts, the ho home ec, you know, and you might be sewing and do mathematics and yeah, doing fractions because yeah. you're sewing right. seam allowances and whatever. And then they would have tech three would be the living arts with the cooking. And you'd be See, measuring. You, why wonderful. do we have metric versus yeah. the, the standard measurements? Yeah. And so it was, it was all integrated into the, instead of going to home ec class and going to physics yes. class. So and you were making and you were doing you were it for making, specific purposes. Yeah, I remember that geometry was, building yeah. a stellar isosahedron. I still remember the name of the thing. It was like cutting up straws and stringing yeah. th thread you through were, it so that you could build it into a <laughs> star you were structure. Making things to be used mm -hmm. more. And I, at one time, they were building a what were they building a, a log cabin outside? It was uh, what was that? It was industrial arts to be used not just to build a log cabin. I think it had some function, wasn't it? Were they making maple Tom syrup in Keck, it? I forget. And Tom Keck, he was the, <clears throat> and he had that idea. Right, right. It, industrial. It was all different now. Right. I mean, I wish I'd gone to school at a place like that. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I could have learned at least some uh, manual arts. You know, I mean, you know, like mm -hmm. how to wire a lamp. Uh -huh. I am the you know, just good, useful household things. I knew nothing about it. Yeah. And in fact, I couldn't have any because it was all, that was all for boys. Yeah. So thank goodness all that's well, changed. I'll tell you, given that it was only one, I forget if it was one quarter of the year or if, like for the whole year you did these four texts, but they changed all the time. These, you know, eighth graders had their little teams of four or five people, each building a structure that was about this wide and, you know, the length of a two by four, you know, I guess, you know, hmm. seven feet or something. So you build this little house and it had the electrical outlets and you're, yeah, eighth grade girl, we were, we were pretty bound up in our uh, expectations of gender um, uh -huh. <laughs> behaviors at that time. Mm -hmm. Like, this is what my dad does. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, I, yeah, I think that the, the, and typically you chose your own team. So you're like with four other girls and you're like, none yeah. of you knows what you're doing. Or maybe one does and you all lean on that one. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I would say I'm still not competent at wiring a lamp. I depend on my husband. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, but at least you, I mean, you got some exposure. And some it, exposure. The right. idea of it. And it, some girls would just actually. just for, you know, it's not right. artificially. But some girls separate. may have found that they loved it and yes. had the opportunity to become more skilled at it or at least be open it's to great, the idea. Because right, something right. goes wrong and you learn how to fix it rather than, right. I mean, and all the whole, all the, there's so many changes now, and uh, right. you can't, there's no reason why you have to expect that there's always going to be some, somebody around in your house who's going to be able to do right. these things. Right. Um, 
right. and you had better, you, you have to learn these things. And it's good, too, because then you can rely on yourself, and you feel more competent, and I mean, that's good, isn't it? That, that, <laughs> that is good, that is yeah. good. So, so thank you very much for joining us today. Well, um, I've had so much fun. Covered a little <laughs> bit about the art, a little mm. bit about the working on a school board, and um, and we didn't get actually too much to the classroom with walls, but we should do that with pictures on another day. So There's thanks. so much to talk about about <laughs> there that is. school and about the well, just what's happening in education today in the schools. Mm -hmm. I do think Vermont School has very good schools. I do think it does, I, and I, I, really I do. think that um, we don't appreciate mm -hmm. how good our schools are compared to a lot of parts of the country. Really? Well, we can talk about that on another um, show, mm -hmm. but thank you very much for joining us. This was um, a conversation on the genesis of U32 in the middle of Vermont with Betty Keller and Alice Blatchley. I had mentioned um, some of the school board members, and um, I know that several of them have passed, but um, some of them we don't actually know. Um, about them and if anybody has information they would like to share about the history of the school including the whereabouts and health of some of the early board members or early teachers you can reach out to u32historyproject at gmail.com that's u32historyproject at gmail.com thank you this program is part of a public access television series to get the ball rolling for a history project, an experiment in public education, a cooperative history of U32, a rural junior-senior high school in Vermont. The co-producers are Betty Keller and Woden Teachout, and they're recorded at Orca Studio, with much appreciation to the Orca staff for their assistance. The hope is that people associated with U32 during its development and during its early years will record additional audio, video, or written materials to share their experience. If you wish to assist in this project, please send an email to u32historyproject at gmail.com. That's u32historyproject at gmail.com. Thank you.